Okay, brothers and sisters, I think we are very fortunate to uh, have Tan Ajahn uh, bring Ajahn Cha to life, actually, even though he's no longer with us. But just listening, contemplating and reflecting is as though Ajahn Cha is with us today. Okay, it's time for questions. Um, who would like to start first? Well, that, that's the hindrance of doubt, okay, so and doubt is the, uh, is the most tricky and devious of all the hindrances because when you're doubting about something, subjectively it feels like you're being really smart and intelligent, you know, you're, you're reflecting on something, um, but it's important to, to see doubt as a mental state and as a conditioned mental state. Um, so there's certain things that um, we're not yet in a position to really be sure about. Um, and, and one of the skills as meditators um, is to be able to hold things like this and not to have to make a decision about them. You know, is this really helpful or not really helpful? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe I'm deluding myself, maybe it's... And you just go round and round in circles. So you don't have to make a decision about it. You just carry on and just hold it there. You know, it's, 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 it's not a sure thing. Let, let me just see and, and see long term, over a period of months, how this plays out. But I think that um, the um, in terms of dealing with defilements, we need um, a number of tools um, um, that we can uh, call upon to deal with problems. So, so you know, I see um, meditation, um, and I, I encourage people not to see meditation as something you do in order to get a result, and then judge yourself whether you're good or not, whether you get the result that you wanted. But it is a, an exploration um, it is a learning uh, of very many important life skills, and um, and it's a problem-solving um, process. So we can look at meditation as basically more and more refined problems to solve. And sometimes um, you suddenly you're back and and dealing with course problems again. So it's not like stairway to heaven. It's more like a game of snakes and ladders, basically. Um, so you have to be prepared for that. But when you when you when you are having difficulties in practice, if you're getting very um, depressed or stale or things just kind of tough going, then being able to um, draw upon positive emotion is a very um, effective and powerful way of dealing with hindrances, particularly of this sort of sloth, torpor, laziness, depression, um, lack of confidence. And so one of the uh, meditation techniques which is uh, often overlooked is what we call jakanusati. It is the recollection of the good actions that you've performed in the past. And you can do this in a systematic way. And you can start off to begin with by writing things down, the things that you're most proud of, the things that you say, yeah, whatever I've done in my life, you know, some things not so wise, not so good, but I've done this. This is like solid gold, you know. This is, nobody can take this away from me. This was a really good thing. Um, and then when you think about that, it just brings up so much good feeling. 
Um, and that's not a defilement, that's a skillful use of this, the memory of goodness that you performed. And you can cultivate this as a practice. And I, I, I recommend this um, particularly um, for if you're trying to uh, help elderly people, or people at the end of their life who've never meditated before, and you can't expect them to look at their breath or do all these things, it's just too much. But if you can sit there and encourage them to recollect good things they've done in their life, um, and, and like a guided meditation, and, and then the joy that arises in their mind suppresses the hindrances in a way that they could spend hours on their breath and it doesn't work. And individually, we can, we can do this. Um, and as I say, you can be you know, systematically write a few down, and then you go through them, just a few, set like one minute or two minutes on each one, and go one, two, three, and then backwards and forwards. Or if there are ones that are particularly powerful, then you can just focus on one until you get that, that emotion that arises, and then you focus on the emotion itself. So you, you're, you're using the discursive thinking in order to bring up an emotion and then focus on the emotion. So it's similar to like metta, practice and you know meditation can be a lot more you know freestyle than you might think um, you know, like a, um, you can use your imagination you know rather than allowing your imagination to to wander about here and there um, let like a, um, for instance let's say that <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to go, um, tomorrow morning, uh, I'm going to go and offer food to the Buddha and all the great arahants in a cave. Um, I don't, are there not any caves in Singapore, are they? Maybe over, over and I have to cross over the causeway first. But anyway, let's imagine, just imagine that you're going to offer food to the Buddha and Venerable Sariputta and Moggallan and all these arahants. Just think, what would you offer, you know? How would you prepare the food? And just imagine yourself, you know, preparing food to offer to the Buddha. So you can use your imaginative, but it's within certain boundaries. It's following a narrative that you've decided. You're not just letting it go off here and there, but just how you'd wash the, the food and the fruit and how you would chop it and how, and how mindful you'd be and how, uh, how, how great it would feel. And then getting dressed and bathing and, and going to them, uh, and then you get off your vehicle, and then you walk a little bit, and then there's the cave, and then you're crawling in, and you see the the monks or sitting, and the, the the candlelight, and you crawl towards, and you see the Buddha and his bowls open, and you bow, and you put the food. So you can have this whole kind of like movie, but rather than you know the usual kind of movies that you might have in your head, this is one which is. Um, which will bring up this incredible power of positive emotion. This is a resource that we have through our faith and devotion that we that we feel um, it's a resource that we can tap into. And if you're having real trouble making headway with with you know meditation on a physical sensation or the breath, every now and again just take a break um, and um, do this kind of meditation, and it's just. You know, it's just so fun, and it it's just feels so wonderful. And it's all right to feel good, you know. In medicine, some people get really kind of, you know, it's good, therefore it's bad for me. And I'm, you know, <laughs> it's just sort of like the, the Christian heresy, you know. So the, the um, you know, the the idea is that the Buddha said that, uh, you know, there was there were there were some Brahmins who were like criticizing the Buddhists, you know, so they're pleasure seekers. Um, some hedonists, I think, it was the accusation, and this was reported to the, the Buddha, and 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 the Buddha says, "Yeah, that's 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 right. Yeah, we uh, we you know we enjoy the pleasure of jhana, we enjoy the pleasure of meditation, and that's a pleasure and that's a happiness uh, which has no drawbacks. It's not something that's a cause of suffering. Um, so um, sometimes meditators have some." joy and happiness and oh dear I, i'm going to get attached to this i'm going to attach to this you know, you know uh, but the thing is you're already attached to sensual pleasures you know it's not you're starting off with a blank slate um so you wean yourself off of of the 
the attachment to to uh, sensual pleasures um, with the experience of the non-sensual pleasure. But the point is you have right view and you know this isn't the goal of practice, this isn't the end of the path, but this is, um, you know, the perks of the path, you know, this is something that um, uh, we have to go through. If you um, look at the teachings of the the path to uh, to samadhi and to liberation, the fact that uh, directly preceding samadhi is sukha. So sukha is is on the track to samadhi. It's not. It doesn't have to be a distraction from it. Um, when it's known for what it is, and it's not taken to be the goal, or you know, now I've got this pleasant feeling. Now I can stop practicing. And that's that's the danger, but the 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 um, the, the sukha itself is fine, and um, reflecting on goodness um, and drawing upon the this resource of faith and devotion that you have in your heart is a skillful way of suppressing hindrances. Uh, any other question? Okay, one final call for the la last question so that we can close the session. All right, I think Ajahn, if uh, it is okay, we'll close the session and thank you very much again. And I, I think uh, just a reminder that um, the book that Ajahn spoke about so much uh, is only a segment of uh, that's being read tonight. And as Ajahn said, there's 800 over pages. So from cover to cover, I'm sure you'll find lots and lots of uh, wisdom uh, that can be uh, gleaned from the book. Um, probably many of you know that Ajahn is not just a good teacher but a very um, good uh, communicator as well. Uh, he has um, been writing handwritten notes, Dhamma bites if you like. And I, I, I would like to believe that many of these notes are now collector's item because it is in Ajahn's own handwriting. And it's not only in English, I understand that it's also in the Thai script. So I think Ajahn is probably the only teacher that I know that has written things down in handwritten form and preserve it that way. So those of you who are fortunate to go to the Facebook page of some of the organization that posts this. <laughs> okay, uh, please read it. It's really, really, really wonderful. Oh, uh, okay, do you want to say something? Which <laughs> um, okay, um, one of Ajahn Chah's most favorite, famous teachings um, uh, is of still water flowing. So this is derived from that. And the, um, it's in response to a, a, um, a doubt that many people have that if you develop um, meditation to absorption or to stillness, um, that the mind will get stuck there, or it will stagnate, or will become attached to the stillness. And, and people are concerned, always been concerned, well, how, when you have been able to reach this sense of stillness, what do you do next, or how do you go from there? What do, um, and so Ajahn Chah's answer to this was that when you develop samadhi correctly um, there is a balance of the positive emotion and of the wisdom faculty these are in harmony and when the mind becomes still it contains within itself 
the impetus towards wisdom. And to explain this, he gave a simile, or he said, so it's, a, it's such a difficult idea um, that it is a paradoxical image. So he said, Do you, have you ever seen still water? So he said, yes, we've seen still water. Have you ever seen running water? Yes, we have. Have you ever seen still running water? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, well, I don't know. But So this is the idea. It's, it's, it's a phenomena which simultaneously um, uh, ha is, is both still and flowing. So there is that, the stillness uh, and the clarity and the stability of samadhi um, and the, um, and the uh, sharpness and insight of, of wisdom um, together. Another, another simile um, to express the same kind of idea was given by one of Ajahn Chah's contemporaries, Ajahn Buddhadasa, where he said it's like a knife. So for a knife to cut well, you need two, um, you two elements. One is the sharpness of the blade, which is like wisdom, and the other is the weight of the knife, which is like samadhi. So if you have a sharp blade but no weight, it doesn't cut very, very deeply. If you have the weight and, no, and a, a blunt blade, it hardly cuts at all. So you need this balance. Um, and this is uh, you know, one of the key teachings of Thai forest tradition, that, that, that we shouldn't make too much of a separation of ideas of samatha and vipassana, but we're developing a practice in which there is a balance of the, um, of the, the samatha or the positive emotions that support wisdom and the wisdom faculty itself. In certain levels, in certain stages of practice, either one or the other will be prominent. And sometimes the stillness and the, the mindfulness and the, uh, the joy, the clarity and so on, all the, all the samatha elements will be to the fore and the wisdom element will be supportive. And other times the, the wisdom element will be to the fore and the, the um, emotional elements will be supportive, but that it can never be completely separated. So that's like still water flowing. So I, I felt that um, Ajahn Chah's life was one where this, you know, he had um, this grounded in stillness and this solid, imperturbable mind. And yet he was active, he was teaching, he was helping others. He, but even so, with all that action, he, it didn't mean that he ever um, left that stillness. You know, that, info, that stillness informed his, his every action. And so the title of the book is Stillness Flowing. Well, I told you the title itself is, speaks volume, you know, probably just as much as 800 pages in a book. So, so what was our um, Chinese translation? We asked a Chinese expert here. Go ahead. Um, well, the truth of the matter is that there are many, many versions and the translators are still in discussion as to what is the most appropriate. Um, so I What's your, your choice? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I seek forgiveness from all my fellow translators. Um, personally, I would go for Jing Zi Liu Dong. may not be the final choice. Yes, we're, we're, we're having a meeting with the trans, uh, translation group. Uh, so there, we have a group of what, how many people now? 16 uh, people helping to work on the Chinese translation. And there's also a, a Thai and a Portuguese translation underway. So uh, I, I hope that there will be a, in a number of different languages in the next few years. Yeah. 
the project. There are actually two rooms of uh, people who are here, and some of the translators are actually in in the midst yeah, as well. Never mind. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for being such a receptive audience, and um, very nice to meet you all. Sorry, sorry.